Okay, we're now going to turn to what Brian mentioned, the Word of God, and um, we're now going to turn to that today, to our communion service. We're heading up all the way up north. We've got halls up and down the, the coast of here, or the peninsula of South Australia, Adelaide. For those who might be visiting and watching from overseas, we're interstate. We're heading north up to one of the principal pastors here in Adelaide, Pastor Graham Hazeldon. Thanks very much, Pastor Graham. Hand over to you now. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Pastor Chris. Uh, it's a great privilege to be able to serve the Lord, as I have been uh, for many, many years. But it's also a great privilege to know his word and to have his spirit dwelling within us. And I want to talk a little bit uh, today about uh, our state of mind and, and the things that can affect us greatly and, and what God's answer is to these things. We go right back to the beginning, we go back to the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, we read how that uh, God created everything, um, starting, of course, when the world was uh, without form and void and darkness was upon the face of it, till ultimately came to what could be called the epitome of God's creation. And that was to make mankind. And mankind was made, uh, created in the image of God. And we see, of course, from that, uh, that God saw that everything he'd done was good. In fact, when man was created at that time, he said it was very good. But it wasn't very long after that God, had, uh, in, in the scheme of things, had created mankind that a problem arose. And we go to the book of Genesis uh, chapter 6. We will just refer to it now for time. But we read there, that God suddenly realized that every imagination and every thought of man was only evil continually, despite being made in the image of God. The Amplified Bible puts it this way. It says that every imagination and intention of all human thinking was only evil continually. And so this whole imagination and the intention from the heart was wrong. It means from the Hebrew language that the purposes and the desires of the heart were where the problem really existed. It is an inherent problem with mankind simply because of what gave us, is, which is a wonderful thing, is that God gave us a will of our own, that we can make decisions ourselves. But it's like a little statement that I've just read recently where it says that our minds are like our stomachs. It's not how much we put into it. It's how much that we digest. And of course, as we know, there are things in the way of food that are good for us. We know there are things that are bad for us that sometimes we like to eat because they're sweet or the chocolate that some people really love. But really, the problem is that some of these things are not the best for us. And so we find that man was in a bad situation. But then it tells us a couple of verses later that despite the general state of mankind that God had almost repented of that he'd made mankind, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he was this one man that was different this one man was different, as it tells us, in that he walked with God. So he had this wonderful position, as an amplified version puts it, that he was in habitual fellowship with God when he walked upright with God. And really, if we look at the two situations of the great influence of evil and the influence of good that was in the life of, of Noah, what we, uh, sorry, if I know it there, I should say, is that we see that to us, the answer is still the same. The answer is that Noah found grace. And if we walk in the grace of God, then we have favor with God ourselves. That we need to be in that state of mind that we habitually do walk with the Lord. And I'm going to ask you to, if you've got a Bible, to open up in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. And we read in verse 9, where it says, The heart is deceitfully, is deceitful above all things 
and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, in verse 10, search the heart. I try the reins and even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. And so we see this situation of the heart being described. Another version puts it that the heart is deceitful above all things and is exceedingly corrupt and perverse and mortally sick. Who can know it? Which means to perceive and understand or be acquainted with his own heart and with his own mind. So when we read that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. If you look up the meaning of the word heart, it's not just talking about that organ in our body that pumps the blood around, that sustains our life because the life is in the blood. But the word heart as described here is talking about the heart and the mind together. If you look up the, the, the concordance, you'll find it's the heart and the mind. We'll explain why, even scientifically, that this is the situation later. But the heart relates to the feelings, the will, and the intellect. And what it tells us in verse 14 of this same chapter is that we need to be healed and saved, particularly from the things that enter into our mind and into our hearts. The Word of God, the Bible tells us, is there to renew our mind, to change the thoughts and the intents of the heart that we have so that we're in line with God, that we can walk in this world despite the corruption and despite the difficulties and the problems we all have in our life in a state of mind that pleases God. And that's what's so very important. But what gives us that ability to do it as we know and we've heard all testified here today, the great testimonies talking about, in fact, one, even our brother um, Danny mentioned his prayer that we, we need to have a sound mind. And he said that there. But in our testimony, it's the fact that when we come to know the Lord, we have an experience with God. And that experience, as the Bible calls it, is when we're born again. We're born again of water and the spirit. We, we repent of our ways. We bury our life uh, by full immersion in baptism in water and symbolic of God's son's death. We rise up in units of life and then God promised to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we speak supernaturally in a wonderful new tongue. And I remember that was my experience, that when I was baptised over 60 years ago, that I came up out of the waters of baptism and I just cried out to the Lord a couple of hallelujahs and the next thing I sat in the baptism tank listening to myself speaking these funny words. And that experience has been with me ever since and the Lord has promised me that he'll never leave and forsake me. If I walk away, I've got the problem. But God never has a problem with what he promises. He gives you a promise and he sticks to his promises. And so what we need to understand is that that which comes out of our lips needs to be right before God, before him. And the word of God, as I mentioned, is there to renew our minds, to change the thoughts, processes, and the intent of the heart. Because, as I said, they're interrelated. We think with our head but we feel with our heart. And so the two are connected. And even in the literal fashion, they're connected. But when it talks about giving us this power to renew our minds, the word renew means to bring about basically a renovation, to clean out the old thoughts and the old ways that might be in our life and presenting to us as everyone can see, something completely new. And it's amazing how people uh, can see that when someone receives the Holy Spirit. And I can remember 
a friend of ours that went and got baptized and received the Holy Spirit. And she went home after because her husband didn't want her to go and be part of this fellowship. And she walked in the door and never said a word. And he turned around and he says, you've received that Holy Spirit, haven't you? He just could tell a wife that he'd known in his life for some time had something happened to her. He said, you've received that Holy Spirit. And praise the Lord, eventually he come along to the Lord himself. And so it's clearing the old ways of our life and bringing anything that's old to the point where it's no more important. It's like the Bible says, even in the New Testament, that all things will pass away, pass away, and behold, all things become new. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, verse 16, it tells us, For the which cause we faint not, and though our outward man perish, as we're getting older and things like that, Yet the inner man in Christ can be renewed day by day. It's not to do with anything to do with age. It's the presence of God that is in our life. There's a little thought that I also read that says, the happiness of your life depends on the character of your thoughts. And, you know, the wonderful thing about having the Spirit of God is that you know what's right. And that's the character that you develop in your life, is that you want to be like Jesus. You want to follow the example right through in your life. And I want to go from there to the book of uh, Proverbs, and I'm going to read from Proverbs in chapter 17. In Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 20, it says, He that has a froward heart findeth no good. And it says, for he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. And so it talks about a froward heart. It's not a term we probably use today. But what it really means, if you look into the meaning of the word in the concordance, a froward heart means one that is perverse, one that distorts things, the truth, or simply one that is crooked in their ways. And so what happens is that people react the way they feel in their heart. But God is always, where there's a difficulty, promised that if he is in our life, things will be different. And if we just go to verse 22 of this same chapter, and it says here, and it's a wonderful scripture and a favourite of mine. It says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And a broken spirit, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Another version puts this verse, a happy heart is good medicine. And a cheerful mind works healing. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. And so a broken spirit is when we're thinking things in our mind that are wrong. Thoughts that we can have can be very toxic. We know that if we have the wrong thoughts or someone upsets us, we react in different ways. We get angry or we, we get, can get fearful of things. We can go into a rage. We can be frustrated and let our frustrations out. We can become very bitter which defiles people. We can end up with low self-esteem. We can have guilt. And, and there's a number of other things that can happen when our thoughts are toxic in our mind. But in the body, it's been shown that when we have these toxic, or we call them toxic or bad thoughts, that the reality is that they produce chemicals in our body that are counterproductive to our body. They really affect your whole being. And when someone's upset and angry, the whole body is affected and upset by it. And yet, what the Bible tells us, and God, King David wrote in Psalm 139, verse 14, how that we are fearfully and we're wonderfully made. 
the body is, a, is an amazing machine. We're made in the image of God. And man is still learning how God put us together and how everything works the way that God intended it to be when he said it was very good. But it's the heart and mind that has a very big influence on our body, how we behave in our body, particularly if we get upset. And the opposite is that if our heart is at peace within ourselves, then we're at peace. You know, if we don't listen to our heart, it causes this imbalance in our body and it just releases these chemicals that we mentioned that put our bodies into a state that is a common term used today, a state of stress. Stress makes your body sick and it comes from bad thoughts and toxic thoughts that come into your very being. But the Lord wishes that when we're in a state, when we're not good or we need to be healed or we're sick, God's wish is that we might be well again. And if we have a look over to the book of James and James and chapter 5, is where I'm going to read from now, some very well-known scriptures here, but it relates to how that we understand what God can do for us. And we read here in chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you afflicted? James wrote. Let him pray. You've got a problem. Whatever it is, pray about it. If anyone is, uh, um, is, is there any uh, mercy? Mary. Uh, sorry, is any Mary? Uh, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call upon the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith. This is our belief in God and who he is and what he can do for us. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he's committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. And so it gives us a wonderful answer to what that God is able to do for us. If we've got a sickness, we've heard some testimonies already today. If we've got a problem, the answer is to look to the Lord. The prayer of faith in God is what gives you the ability to overcome your problems and your difficulties. And of course, people even sometimes ask the question, how does prayer heal? Well, the answer is faith in God. That's how God heals, by having faith in him. Because faith in God is a a very powerful effect in people's lives. Faith gives us that sense of hope and is a control in their life that counteracts stress. If you get a problem and a difficulty and stress in your life, if you draw aside for a few minutes, even though you might be upset, and you start praying and looking to the Lord in faith, and faith is the substance of the things that you hope for, the evidence of things not seen. It literally brings absolutely beneficial changes in your natural body. When people pray in faith, they experience a decrease in things like blood pressure. They produce a, a situation where it reduces the heart rate. It helps with their metabolism and helps with their breathing even. It's amazing what prayer can do. In 1988, there was a cardiologist named Dr. Randall Ferd in America. And he decided to conduct a survey looking at what could prayer do with a patient who did not even know what they were being prayed for. Obviously, he was a believer. We don't know much about him. But what he did in San Francisco's Central Hospital back there in 1988, 
divided the group of 393 patients that had heart attacks into two groups. And one group was prayed for by Christians. We don't know what that means. I'm just relating the fact that they, were, they prayed for the people that were sick. And the other half group of the group had no prayer offered up for them at all. And we're not talking about spirit-filled people. We're just talking about prayer in general in this particular occasion. And even the people that were prayed for didn't know whether they prayed for or they weren't prayed for. But the group that were prayed for when they did a complete rundown of everything that happened and notated everything, the group that had prayer offered up for them had fewer complications. They had fewer cases of pneumonia, cardiac arrest, congestive heart failure, and they needed less medication and antibiotics, etc. It was just such an amazing and an interesting thing that just praying for somebody else. And that's what we do in our fellowship. If we get a message, we had a message uh, uh, that there were different people who have needs today and we'll be praying for them and upholding them before the Lord. But we know that our God answers prayer, as we've just said. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And there was one doctor that did this uh, survey, or that was involved in the study rather than the survey. His name was Dr. Larry Dossi. And he became so convinced in the results of that prayer effect in people's lives that he wrote a little book and he called it Prayer is Good Medicine. We just read from a moment ago from Proverbs that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Prayer is a good medicine. In 1996, there was a meeting of 219, uh, 269 family physicians at this particular hospital or area, and they did a survey about prayer and faith. And 99% said that they thought that religious beliefs could contribute to the healing of the natural body. I don't know it would be quite 99% these days, but that's what it was back in 1996. It's like the Bible tells us here in James, a little further on from where we read, that we should pray one for another. In the book of 2 John chapter 3 and in verse 2, it says, God wants us to prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Even in our wonderful relationship with the Lord, God wants above all things that we should be prospering or having our needs met and that we should be in good health. That's God's wish, even as our soul prospers. The soul involves the mind, the free will, the emotions, and free, with free will we can be at peace within ourselves and we can reject any adverse thought that affects our relationship with God. We can reject it. It's when that we meditate upon wrong things that we put our body under this stress that does so very much affect us. That's when we get angry and fearful and upset in, in every sort of a way. But if our thoughts are positive, which happens as a result of prayer, we feel good. And we have that godly thoughts that is God's fruit that can come into our life of love and joy and peace, long-suffering, etc., that helps us. But medical science has revealed many things unto us about the human body. And even if we have a look at it, about even that organ that's at the top of our head called the brain. Now, the brain is an amazing organ. There's still so many things that they're learning about the human brain. But a little bit of background information for you. That in our brain, which weighs around about one and a half kilos or, 
or uh, about three pounds in weight if you're a bit older. There are 86 to 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. 86 to 100 billion neurons in our brain. And regardless of the fact we have all these neurons in our brain, do you know how much of our brain we actually use according to the scientists? We use one or two percent of our total brain capacity. In fact, they actually tell us that we've got so much space in our brain if we use the whole thing up, that we would have 300 years of space in our brains. Even one of the greatest minds in the last century, Albert Einstein is recorded to have had the ability to use five or six times, uh, uh, five or six percent of the brain, where most of us only use one to two percent. So there's still a lot that's there. And so with our brain, it gives us a little bit of a picture about things. If you go into the center of the brain, you've got an area which is longish like a sausage and it's called the corpus callosum and that is the thinking center of our brain where things go into the brain they go to the corpus callosum and around the outside of it the area around it is called the cortex and it's in the cortex where you've got most of these uh, neurons and we there we store the memories that we have whether they're good or whether they're bad. At the very front of the brain, there's a little small round section called the hypothalamus. And that is the connection between the mind and the body. It's called the mind-body connector, the hypothalamus. And the nerves in the brain, or the neurons, are quite interesting in that they're like a tree and the, they have the roots going into the cortex and then the, the tree grows um, and has a trunk in these nerves and then on the top of the trunk are all these little branches. All these little branches where all the memories that we have from various reasons are stored. They're, they're called dendritic branches of the brain. The more a neuron is activated, the more branches that it grows. And that's, of course, what happens with people. They dwell on the wrong things, and on those particular neurons, they grow more branches, and they become so strongly affecting the brain and the thinking of the person. So in other words, it, from our brain, or in our brain, we can either build good memories, or toxic ones or bad ones. Bad memories are toxic to the body, as we've already mentioned. But if we have good memories, it does influence and counteracts the bad thoughts that can be in our minds. And of course, we study the word of God, and that's what has the big influence on our mind. We get good memories from the word of God. And through our eyes, we read the word of God, or we see things. Through our ears, we listen to the word of God. But the information then is uh, processed by the brain, and it becomes a thought. And it goes into our free will, and it's stored away as a memory. But if you're not listening when someone's speaking to you, then it is not stored. It's like going into hot air and disappearing. If you meditate upon something, you build a memory in your brain, whether it's good or bad. Medical science tells us that if we have good memories, like when we're reading our, our Bible, it actually produces counter, counteracting the things that come into our mind when we have bad thoughts of when we get angry and we're stressed. The good chemicals are like the endorphins and the dopamine. And it makes you feel good 
when you read the word of God, you feel good if you let it go into your heart and into your mind. In Proverbs chapter 4, just to quote a couple of verses, it says, My son, attend unto my words and incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes and keep them in the midst of thy heart. So what we're reading here is, as in the book of Proverbs, that you can change your thinking to good, to godly things, and you can uh, really neutralise or cancel out those toxic thinkings and thoughts by dwelling on the word of God. And this is what happens when you renew or you renovate your mind in the way you look at things. A wonderful scripture on this side of things is also in well-known scripture in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where it says, do not be conformed to this world, this age. Or as it says in the Amplified Bible, fashioned after and adapted by its external superficial customs. But be ye transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a, fresh, a, sorry, a fresh and a spiritual attitude. But what about the heart? We talked about the mind and the brain and how it's made up and how we have these neurons and how that we, we uh, have the cortex that stores up thoughts, whether it's good or it's bad. But the heart, too, has a brain. And that's why it's interesting that when the word heart is used back in Jeremiah, it means the heart and the mind. Because in the heart, there are around 40,000 neurons that are exactly the same as in the brain. And there's an interconnection Messages come from the brain to the heart and from the heart back to the brain. And so the heart receives messages from the brain and sends messages back. And this is a study in science called cardioneurology. And it functions in our being like a conscience that we have. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it come all the issues of life. Being careful what you put into your heart. Just a couple more thoughts in finishing. I want to go to Second Corinthians and chapter 10. Second Corinthians and chapter 10. We read here in verse 5. Paul writing to the church, a spiritual church at Corinth. And it says in verse 4, I should say, that, that um, chapter 10, verse 4, it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're natural, not natural weapons, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, the stronghold of the enemy, the stronghold of the things that affects us badly in our life. And it says here, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought unto the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to avenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And so as it puts it in another version of verse 5. And that's the problem, is that when we have a problems that are affecting our life, cast down every imagination. Literally, it means to lock up the thoughts that are bad. Don't let them affect us and put our body into stress. The other version says there's much that we refudiate arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing 
that set itself up against the real knowledge of God. Our weapons are not natural. The battlefield is our mind. And that's why it says that we cast down all these natural things and we lead every thought and purpose into activity under the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last weekend, I was uh, had a talk in, in Fiji, you know, and um, enjoyed the fellowship there. But I just want to quickly mention a brother's testimony. His name was Andrew, and he's from Wainainu, however they say it over there. And this particular brother gave in his testimony the thoughts that he was in prison. He thought he knew everything. He got himself into strife. But while he was in prison, he was witness to about the fact that you can have a new life and you can be born again. And so the very moment he left prison, he went out and found the lo local revival fellowship. And he, that day he was baptized immediately. He was just waiting to get to a revival meeting. He received the Holy Spirit speaking in another tongue. He was baptized. And that day changed his life, his reasoning, his understanding, his heart and his mind. And he says, now I'm in lockdown, but it gives me more time to pray in the spirit to my God. And he says that he has a habit now, as he's in lockdown over there in Fiji, to spend one to two hours on his knees. And when he gets up, it makes him feel good that young man and he's still a young man is now a pastor on the island and in charge of the church over there i want to just finish in the book of philippians just a, a quick thought or two again scriptures we know very well in verse seven it says well in verse six we'll go to it says that be careful for nothing but in everything by fear and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. The very good thing. The peace of God passes understanding and keeps your heart and your mind. How? Through Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to explain, brethren, you just want to get a final point across, a theme for a thought in your life he says whatever things are, are true honest just pure lovely of a good report if there be any virtue and there be any praise think on these things think on the good things and fix them in your heart and in your mind because that gives you a sound mind david wrote in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. And praise the Lord. That is what we want, to encourage everyone in the name of Jesus. And I'll hand back to Pastor Chris.